Back to the Future was like one of my favorite movies, but besides Marvin Barry, there was really no one to relate to in that film. And I always dreamed of time traveling. This is the book I always wanted to read as a kid. I wanted to create really a safe space for us to uh, imagine that and to see ourselves in that space. Welcome to Securing the Bag, The Roots exclusive series all about work, entrepreneurship, and the secrets to success. Today we have with us musician, yep. DJ, mm -hmm. producer, mm -hmm. filmmaker, author, and now publisher who has Grammys and Oscar and a host of awards for the amazing work that he's produced. Welcome Questlove. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. So as someone who has so much going on, how do you decide what projects you wanna put your energy behind? You know, I think, I'm sensitive to uh, the idea of erasure, and I know how easy that can be. And oftentimes, there's forms of erasure that aren't even like intentionally erased. I'm not talking about like the whole idea of crit critical race theory being like pushed to the side, but more or less, um, we're, we live in a, a time now w which the uh, abundance of information is just so high volume that some things are gonna slip through the cracks. Like my intention is always from the gate to teach, but without having to do this, like I don't wanna be that the dotting father that's like, ah, 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 that sort of thing. So kind of with anything that I do, there has to be an educational uh, eureka moment that makes people realize. And I want them to realize it. I don't wanna to have to spell it out. And so I think that's, people feel more enlightened when they discovered it on their own. So I give them the leeway to do that. So I do my movies, my TV shows, my books, my music, everything. Let's talk about your new book, The yeah. Rhythm of Time, which mm -hmm. I understand is the first in a series. Yeah. And I, I guess I would describe it as kind of a science fiction sort of book for middle grade readers, but you could probably yeah. do better justice. Can you tell us what it's about? So essentially, um, this is the book I always wanted to read as a kid. Um, I come from the eras, having been born in the 70s, where you just had to sort of vicariously put yourself in the character's shoes, whether you relate to them or culturally relate to them or not. You know, like Back to the Future was like one of my favorite movies, but besides Marvin Barry, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> or, or the Goldie Wilson, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the, the future mayor of, uh, of that town, um, there was really no one to relate to in that film. And I always dreamed of time traveling and even like, I do random games with people like, okay, what if you can go back in time, where would you go? And oftentimes with black people, that's a triggering question. And so I wanted to create really a safe space for us to uh, imagine that and to see ourselves in that space. It's, it's a story about two kids, Keja, uh, she's a science genius and also a beat maker, and uh, Raheem, who might or might not be loosely based on me. I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, it's an anagram for uh, Amir. And um, I guess uh, Keja is known for her uh, expansive scientific mind and she often invents these sort of devices. Uh, Raheem accidentally winds up going to 1997 and uh, he- That's one it, of the best years of my life, I must say. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, 97 was a, bit, a banner year for a lot of us. So um, he inadvertently runs into one of his favorite groups because he's a music aficionado. So, and that chance bump meeting with the group sort of affects the rest of history once he gets back to uh, modern times and he realizes that he has to fix things because everything in, in his life has changed, everything in her life has changed, everything in their family, in the music world, in history, in the entire universe has changed because of that minor five second interaction, you know, with his favorite group back in 1997. And we're just having fun with it. Like just, uh, it's a lot of twist and uh, twist every turn and, Definitely. And I will have to say this middle grade, like those kids ages eight to 12, that's a tough audience to write for. But I love that you make the, the hacker, computer genius, beat maker. It's a female character. Did you do that on purpose? Absolutely. Like, um, you know, oftentimes when we speak of, uh, of our women, like we never use the term genius or like we, it's always like, you know, you're, you're pretty and that sort of thing. So I really just wanted to turn everything on its head 
So I want to go back in time a little bit. Yeah. You attended Philadelphia's High School for the Creative and Performing Arts, yeah. which also um, is where you met your Roots co-founder, Tariq yeah. Troner. But it also produced a lot of talented artists Everyone. that we know. I mean, Boys to Men. Boys to Men, Amela Rue, uh, half the jazz world, yeah. Chris McBride, Joey DiFrancesco, so many actors and actresses. Like my, my particular year, I'm the class of 89, um, but even then, like uh, Jasmine Sullivan went there, Bilal went there. Um, I'm missing so many. Oh, from Hamilton. Uh, Lamar Odom. Yes, Lamar Odom. Yeah, like my my uh, my school is absolutely. I mean, so highly that's favorite. Huge, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, what kind of impact did going to a school like that have on your creativity and how you are as an artist today? Okay, so a big part of this group mirrors my real life, and you know, black parents were really, again, big on safety. And so my parents never wanted me to go to, quote, regular public school. They wanted me to go to private school and then hopefully um, I would uh, eventually go to uh, high-end Ivy League school, or whatever. My dad wanted me to go to Juilliard or Curtis Institute, but none of these schools that I was going to in, in, during my high school years, you know, it was like 23 students. I mean, I, I would have been the smartest person, but just, it wasn't my dream. So I kind of had to beg them in the 11th grade, like, can I please go to regular school with regular kids? And, you know, I just discovered that kids know how to play instruments as good as I do. Because I only grew up in my father's, like, band and in his world. I never went outside to play. So I really, besides my cousins, I've really never had peers my age that I really connected with. So I, I had to beg to go to performing arts school. Like, my first day in that in that school literally like you know like uh when tourists are walking in new york and the way they're they're not supposed to do like yes <laughs> like everyone's breaking out in song boys to men is literally like first second day of school like in the bathroom I harmonizing <laughs> oh my dancers goodness. are like you know stretching in the hallway and all that stuff and it was it was the most craziest foreign experience of my life and um the way that i met Tariq. Um, you know, I was trying to figure out, like, who's my click? Like, have you ever seen Clueless, the way that she breaks down, like, all the demographics and the psychographs? Like, those are the goth kids, those are the art kids, those are the thugs, those are the, you know. I was, I was uh, waiting in line to get my ID taken, my ID picture taken, and I heard these, like, um, four or five girls, like, slightly ahead of me talking about Prince. And I was like, hmm, what? So I was trying to figure out how to double dutch my way into this conversation. And, and of course, like I crashed the conversation. Like, no, no, actually, that was a that was a B side on a Japanese uh, bootleg import. And they're oh, just gosh. they're looking at me like, <laughs> no one asked you. <laughs> and I was doing anything to just keep the conversation going. So I kind of I kind of lied, and was like, yeah, you know, I, I got a group, and uh, you know, and they're like, you got a group who? And I remembered that this kid was like freestyling in the lunchroom like the day before, and I just happened to see him walk by. I was like, well, that guy over there. And then I went to class. And then later in that class, my orchestra class, I thought about my lie, and I was like, I better fix this. And I ran up to the eighth floor, <laughs> saw him in the lunchroom. I was like, if anyone, if anyone asks you, we're a group. And Tariq was just like, okay. I'm about to give away my age here, but I discovered the roots in college. I was in my second year when uh, Do You Want More came I out. I assure you I'm way older than okay, you are. Okay, so. cool. <laughs> Your kids it's a safe me. space. Here. Right. And I just remember a friend of mine turned me on and gave me the CD for right. those of you who don't know what it Whatever is. Whatever that is. But, right. I mean, it was something that I could listen to to from front to back. And I remember thinking to myself, these guys are doing something different. I mean, no samples, you're playing instruments. Mm -hmm. And I mean, forget about Black Thought and just, right. he's just a ridiculous MC. Yeah. And now I feel like even 28 years later, however long, 30, it, still, it. it still holds up. And <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. So I wonder if anyone ever tried to discourage you from doing what you're doing, that kind of that new- Has anyone ever tried to discourage me? Did they try to discourage you? Absolutely. I try to discourage me. Really? And that's that's sort of the, the, I think the most important life lesson that I learned in the pandemic, which led me to finally write this book because we say stuff to ourselves that we would never let anyone else say. Like if someone else were to tell me, you can't write no 
spoke about time travel. Like you just seen the complete Star Wars uh, <laughs> like <laughs> series a month ago. Like I'd start fighting, just pugilism time. But um, again, parents were big on safety and being small. You know, when I was a kid, I was a real cute kid and everyone pinch his cheeks and then oh, his afro. Like my afro was gargantuan. And then one day, like my dad was just like, okay, you're not cute anymore. And suddenly at the age of nine or 10, like now I'm a threat. You know, if you see bullies, drug dealers, police, whatever, like make yourself small and hide in plain sight. And so when you just live a life where you're just trying to get through 24 hours, where even something as menial as, hey, go to the store for me, turns into a, a, a war mission to, to avoid things and you're hiding behind cars so that no one sees you and that you don't have to get beat up or anything. That sort of does something to your psyche. And I had to learn in the pandemic, I know like we're really big on like sort of snarking what we see like entitled kids, but I, I think the opposite, I think we should be entitled. And I mean, there's a way to be confident and not to be rude or arrogant. Oftentimes we, we evidence sort why we don't deserve things. And you know, it's, it's real, even Oscar night. When I won, people always ask me like, what was your opinion of the slap? Cause that was my category. You know, I don't know if they believe me or not, but it's like when you're, when you are um, in that position, when you literally see a, a, a time clock go by and when you know your life's about to change, like that whole thing, like the whole nomination thing, like I wasn't even in the room. Like I'm sitting there panicking because like, I'm going through the list of who might be happy for me or not, might not be happy for me, who will support me, who will ridicule me. So I'm not even paying attention to what happened on that stage sure. because I'm inside my head panicking the Oscars is just like one of maybe 50 other, you know, there's like the Director's Guild, the Producer's Guild, where I just sat in the audience like, I don't want to win, I don't want to win, I don't want to win, I don't want to win. Because no one likes being singled out. And so if anything, I just want people to take away, especially with this book, like dreaming is important, fantasizing is important, writing out your goals are important, and really seeing it through and like, the voice in your head is you have to silence it. So because the show is called Secure in the Bag, I have to ask, when in your career did you realize that you had finally secured the bag? And it doesn't have to mean money, just maybe. When did I make it? What you can, when you felt like you had truly made it. I, I really didn't allow myself to celebrate myself. I've always thought celebrating myself was like a jinx. I know, man, it's like, all this time I've been fooling you people like, <laughs> yes, I've been living the lowest vibrational <laughs> journey for 30 years. I think most people would say like, oh, having an Oscar could be that moment. But I think the, the Oscar will be currency that will allow me to do other things. Like now I'm, I'm about to direct the, uh, the Aristocats for Disney. But I think there's, I think the one moment where I felt like, good job, Amir was in 1998 in which um, I've always heard this story that um, my mom has been promised a, a Volkswagen uh, Beetle for the longest if I was a boy. And my dad never got her that car. So the first real money that I made, like I started seeing a nice check around like 1997, four years after The Roots came out and so, um, Christmas morning, giving her that, that Volkswagen uh, Beetle was, that meant everything to me. And you know, that was my, that was my moment. That's where I felt like I made it. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I have had such a great time talking to you today. Thank you so much. Thanks I so much, it. Questlove. Thank you.